Ladies and gentlemen, good morning and welcome to the Center for Strategic and International Studies. If I could encourage you those in the back to please take their seats, we'll get started. Thank you for joining us this morning. My name is Scott Miller. I'm the Scholl Chair in International Business. We're on the International Business Program here at CSIS. And we're delighted to have you here this morning to discuss uh, APEC and the in infrastructure investment opportunities and challenges. Uh, as I begin, I'd like to thank the uh, two other organizations who are co-sponsors <coughs> of uh, this program. Uh, the uh, National Association of Manufacturers and the National Center for APEC. We've been pleased to work with them as partners. They've been, uh, you'll, you'll see them, uh, their representatives throughout the morning and we're delighted to, uh, to have this working relationship with them. Also, I uh, want to uh, acknowledge uh, that today's event has been made possible by a grant from Chevron. Economic growth and job creation rely on long-term investment in critical infrastructure in energy, in transport, in water, communications in particular. The McKinsey Global Institute estimates that between now and the year 2030, which is 18 years from now, just to keep pace with population growth and GDP growth, the world will need to invest 57 trillion, with a T, dollars in critical infrastructure. Now, that, to put that in perspective, the past 18 years, the world has invested about 30 trillion, so it's a 60% increase over the next 18 years versus the previous rate in order just to keep up with the, with the growth of population and GDP. In infrastructure, as in most kinds of investment, demand typically exceeds supply. That's especially true since the 2007-2009 global financial crisis and the consequent slow growth in de developed economies and fiscal deleveraging that takes place in the United States and elsewhere. The Asia Pacific e Economic Cooperation Group has focused on investment in, in the Asia Pacific for nearly 20 years. It was 1994 that APEC began its, in, its, its investment experts group. And APEC Business Advisory Council, the business component of APEC, has intensified work on this program since 2008. In 2011, uh, the, uh, there were the uh, APEC uh, Business Advisory Council and the National Association of Manufacturers published a, a report called Investing for Growth. And in 2013, this year, the work plan of the APEC Business Advisory Council includes uh, developing a checklist for the enablers of infrastructure investment. At today's conference, we'll examine the benefits of infrastructure investment and consider views from the U.S. private sector on both the challenges and opportunities in the Asia-Pacific region. To start things this morning, we are delighted to host uh, His Excellency Jose Cuisia, Ambassador of the Republic of the Philippines to the United States. The Ambassador has been uh, in Washington as Ambassador to the White House for just a little over two years. He has a long career in banking and insurance prior to his appointment as ambassador, and he served ably as both the commissioner of the Philippine Social Security System and as a governor of the Central Bank of the Philippines. We are delighted to be with him this morning. He will look forward to his presentation and follow with a panel discussion. Mr. Ambassador. Thank you, Scott, for that very kind introduction. Distinguished uh, panelists, uh, Mr. Scott Miller, our distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good morning to all of you. As you will see, I am focusing on opportunities and challenges in infrastructure investment in the Philippines because that is what I am most familiar, as I mentioned to Scott Miller. I hope my other panelists will, will cover other countries and hopefully uh, APEC as a whole. Thank you to CSIS and to Scott Miller for inviting me to share with you the infrastructure challenges and opportunities in the Philippines. In 2005, well, let me first show you the outline of my presentation today. Here you will see I'll cover infrastructure challenges in the Philippines, Good Governance Agenda of the Aquino Administration, Opportunities in Infrastructure Projects, Attracting Investments in Infrastructure, and the Philippines Hosting of APEC 2015. 
In 2005, the World Bank conducted a study on the infrastructure challenges in the Philippines, in the Philippines and found the following infrastructure challenges, low spending on infrastructure, inefficient use of existing resources, poor business environment, unsatisfactory public sector performance, lack of long-term planning and coordination of infrastructure, lack of a healthy framework for suitable financing opportunities for infrastructure, and a decrease in private sector involvement. The response of the Philippines to these infrastructure challenges were as follows. Uh, increased infrastructure spending from 1% in 2005 to 2.6% 2 of GDP in 2012, uh, and the intent was, of course, to continue to increase this up to about 5% of GDP, which is the benchmark, uh, by 2016. It also adopted um, the five R's, right project, right quality, right people, right cost, and right on time. These are the, of course, guiding posts. Improved business environment, transparency, and anti-corruption uh, was, of course, uh, strengthened. Streamlining uh, of, and online processes uh, were, of course, adopted also by the government. Uh, Now, the underlying principle of the Philippines transformation is President Aquino, good governance is good economics mantra. Embodied in the Philippine Development Plan, our goals to accelerate sustainable infrastructure development and achieve inclusive growth. Okay, thank you. Ready? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> so you'll see from this slide the improving economic environment in the Philippines. We're proud of our 6.6% GDP growth in 2012, the highest in, in Southeast Asia. And um, this, the next four, four years, where the government is projecting a growth of 7 to 8%. Through improved revenue and tax efforts, we are increasing resources for infrastructure spending and social spending. As you will see from this uh, slide, uh, the last two years particularly, there's been a significant increase in terms of tax revenues. The improved business climate has led to increased investments, manufacturing being among the top five investment sectors. You'll see from this slide, in better in competitiveness rankings. We improved 10 notches to 65th place in this World Economic Forum Global Competitiveness Report 2012-2013. So over the last two years, we've improved by 20 notches from 85 to 65. We climbed to 61st from 77th in the World Economic Freedom Report and improved to 97th from 107th in the Heritage Foundation 2013 Index of Economic Freedom. As uh, I mentioned here, manufacturing has been among the top five investment sectors. It has grown from 442 to um, 672 billion in terms of the improved investments, uh, or in, in terms of the level of investments over the last five years. The signing of the framework agreement on the Bank Samoro, this is the new entity that's being established in, in, uh, in the south, in Mindanao. Um, and the signing of a final peace agreement, which we hope will take place sometime this year, will lead to just and lasting peace in Mindanao, opening vast opportunities for business and investment. 
All infrastructure sectors have calibrated their work programs to focus on Mindanao and ensure overall inclusive growth. In terms of our energy sector, the Philippines is seeking to increase power generation and is actively promoting renewable energy investments. The, there are incentives that have been provided, um, including income tax holidays, duty-free importation uh, of, of renewable equipment, machinery, equipment, and materials, net operating loss, carryover, and other incentives. Areas in Mindanao are now being offered for oil, gas, and coal exploration and development. A large part of the infrastructure budget is uh, allocated to national roads and highways with convergence with other sectors such as tourism. As you will note from this uh, slide, uh, 100, about 70% of the total budget of 144 billion is being allocated to uh, highways. But there are also uh, allocations for basic education facilities, uh, as well as um, health facilities. <clears throat> the Philippine government has also placed high priority on transport. Because of increase in resources, most projects are locally funded. However, we still continue to rely on uh, ODA or foreign assisted uh, for foreign assisted projects. Uh, there are a number of foreign assisted projects as indicated here, like the Puerto Princesa Airport Development, New Bohol Airport Development Project, and the Bus Rapid Transit System for Cebu City, as well as the Maritime Disaster Response Helicopter Acquisition Project. Water has been considered an, an underinvested sector. Despite the successful privatization of water to service Metro Manila, there's still a great, a great need to apply integrated water resources management and to rationalize financing for Millennium Development Goal commitments. Telecoms has been largely liberalized in the 1990s, but opportunities exist uh, in internet and broadband connectivity, especially urban centers outside the capital. As you will see here, 79% of the country has fiber-based backbone network for domestic and international broadband connectivity. The cellular mobile telephone service is by far the most dominant telecom service. And increasing e-government systems, 94% of the web presence among national government agencies. There is a need to promote more private sector investment in waste management, housing, health, and education. For example, there are untapped opportunities and incentives in solid waste management, and there's a huge backlog of housing units despite high need and, and demand. There's no doubt we want to invest more in infrastructure through smart and transparent spending and promoting public partnerships, projects which have attractive investments. For preferred activities such as agriculture and shipbuilding, incentives such as tax breaks and duty exemptions apply for three to six years, depending on the status of the project, if it is a pioneer project or if it is just an expansion uh, of, the, of an existing project. These incentives apply to preferred and mandatory activities under the Investment Priority Plan 2012. <clears throat> These incentives are further enhanced under the Public-Private Partnership Program. Um, repayment schemes are also available through a share in revenue. Uh, under the BOT law of 1994, the proponent may likewise um, be retained, repaid in the form of a share in the revenues of the project or other non-monetary payments, such as but not limited to to the grant of a portion or percentage of the reclaimed land, for example. I think that's just one example of a non-cash uh, payment. Subject, of course, to the constitutional requirements with respect to the ownership of land. Okay. 
you're looking at nine, um, well, these are, again, uh, in investment incentives applicable to public-private partnership pro projects. So you're looking at nine ongoing public-private partnership infrastructure projects for 2013, and it is happening in different parts of the country. These include uh, a roadway, the Darang, Daang Hari uh, South Luzon Expressway link road project, the LRT Line 1 South Expansion, the Naia Expressway Phase 2 Modernization of the Philippine Orthopedic Center, uh, rehabilitation and O&M of Angat Hydroelectric and so forth. So there are quite a number of PPP projects that are now ongoing. Infrastructure funds are also being developed. One is the Philippine Infrastructure Alliance for, for Infrastructure, or PINA, P -I -N -A. In July 2012, the Asia, Asian Development Bank approved an equity investment in a 625 million private equity fund focused exclusively on Philippine infrastructure projects. Another in progress is the ASEAN Infrastructure Fund. As of October 2012, $450 million has been raised with 20% from ASEAN countries and the rest funded by ADB to promote regional connect connectivity. There are also financing options from American institutions such as the Millennium Challenge Corporation, like Simbank, and OPIC. The Millennium Challenge Corporation, for example, funded a $214 million uh, out of the $434 million compact project or compact grant to finance a 224-kilometer rehabilitation of a secondary national road development project in Eastern Samar, one of the most depressed provinces in the country. The Philippines, led by Apex Senior Official Undersecretary Laura Del Rosario, initiated an informal discussion um, between senior officials on infrastructure at the sidelines of the first ABAC meeting 2013 in Makati. The aim of the informal dialogue was to come up with ways to move Indonesia's proposal on infrastructure connectivity forward. For the Philippines in particular, it was an opportunity to take a lead role in infrastructure issues in preparation for its for its hosting APEC in 2015 and making sure that there was no redundancy and that APEC builds on its past work <coughs> rather than reinvent the wheel. While the Philippines is looking at infrastructure development as a priority, APEC 2015 preparations are still at an early phase. Thematic issues and priorities will be further defined after domestic and APEC consultations are undertaken. With that, let me end my presentation and thank all of you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. That was a very comprehensive presentation and uh, I noted a couple of things. First, very impressive progress by the Philippines in uh, economic reform and the improvement in the competitiveness and economic freedom indices are particularly impressive. I also uh, concluded while I was listening to the Ambassador that uh, a program similar in scope is probably going on in all 21 APEC economies at, at this point. You, you have a very impressive overall program, you have a budget, you have a plan, and uh, multiple approaches. The other thing was interesting about the ambassador's presentation was the many different approaches to getting the infrastructure development, including uh, public-private partnerships. Uh, while that's somewhat unfamiliar in the United States, I will tell you the United States is, believe it or not, doing infrastructure and public-private partnerships. If you want to watch this happen, go to Louisville, Kentucky. In Louisville, Kentucky, there are two bridges being built between Indiana 
and Kentucky over the Ohio River. There were ones in the city, ones out in the, in the suburbs. Because different states, Kentucky controlled the city bridge and, and Indiana controlled the, uh, the bridge out in the suburbs, uh, they had different approaches and Indiana law per permits public-private partnership. So what you have are two bridges being built on the same timetable uh, with the same general contractor. It's an Illinois general contractor building both bridges, one of them classic public sector infrastructure financing, the other public-private partnership. So watch this space, see who's done on time, see who's done under budget, and uh, what might happen in this circumstance. But it's a great bit of uh, a laboratory of democracy going on in the city of Louisville. But the public-private partnerships are becoming a more and more important piece of what's going on to, to close the gap between demand and supply uh, in infrastructure. Uh, I'm pleased to be joined by two panelists this morning. Uh, my colleague, uh, Ted Osius, who is a uh, senior State Department visiting fellow here at CSIS. Uh, Ted is a longtime Foreign Service officer, most recently the Deputy Chief of Mission at the U.S. Embassy in Jakarta, but also served as political counselor in New Delhi uh, before that and uh, has had a, a, a sort of a, a, a career-long tour through uh, the, across Asia. Uh, also would welcome Kamran Khan, uh, Cameron is Program Director for Global Infrastructure Finance uh, Center of Excellence, uh, which is part of the World Bank Group in uh, Singapore. Uh, since 2004, uh, Cameron has run the Singapore office. He opened the office in 2000. He's been with the World Bank since 2004, opened the Singapore office in 2009. And prior to 2004, he had a uh, successful career as an investment banker. Uh, so we look forward to hearing from both of them. I'd like to start with Ted, who will talk about uh, infrastructure development in Indonesia based on his past posting. Sure, and then turn to Cameron for a broader Asia-Pacific perspective. <coughs> I have a, a few slides, too. Um, Let's see if I can get this to end. There we go. Oops. Right here. Yeah. Put the slideshow. Just get a drop down menu. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, I'm going to just go ahead. I want to thank uh, Scott very much for inviting me. It's a real honor to be on this panel with uh, Ambassador Quisha and Kamran Khan. And I thought I would just spend a few minutes on uh, some of the opportunities, thank you, um, that investors might want to consider in Indonesia, uh, the world's fourth largest nation and its third largest democracy. And first, let me be clear about the information I'm going to present. Uh, when I was DCM at our embassy in Jakarta, our economic team, led by Councillor Jim Caruso, observed that Chinese, Japanese, and Korean companies led the way in FDI and infrastructure. Last month, uh, a team of us from CSIS went to Indonesia, and the ambassador, Ambassador Marcial, a U.S. ambassador in Indonesia, reminded us that um, when Indonesia launched its ambitious master plan for acceleration and economic development, its economic ministers visited Seoul, Tokyo, Beijing, and not the United States. So that struck us as, as problematic, that there were, they, they didn't even consider when asked, why didn't you go to the United States? They said, well, we didn't think any American companies were, would be interested. That's a problem. Uh, the, the economic master plan is a 15-year, $1 trillion infrastructure development plan that includes public-private partnership tenders, and it will require about $700 billion in private financing. Uh, but as I said, when, when, when uh, the ambassador asked, well, what about American companies, the, the uh, response was, we don't think they're interested. So we thought we've got to do something about this, and we wanted to, we, we embarked on 
a uh, project to highlight the infrastructure investment opportunities in Indonesia's second tier cities. It seemed that a lot of U.S. companies were reluctant to venture out of Jakarta, uh, and we wanted to make it easier to provide a context and to provide connections for potential investors. So this led first to an MOU uh, between the Ministry of Industry and the Department of State for cooperation on infrastructure development for industrial purposes. And very soon after we signed the MOU, uh, a U.S. company and the state oil company, Pertamina, formed a joint venture to build $2 billion, a $2 billion coal ethanol plant, which will result in $500 million in U.S. exports. It didn't really take that much effort to get to that point. So that suggests to me there are many more opportunities that haven't uh, yet been exploited. So why Indonesia? And if I could, if I can go back, I will, because you, oops, I'm going the wrong direction. Let's see. Previous. Uh, no, nope. previous. I want to see. You have to see all of Indonesia. Nope. It wants to stay in South Sumatra. Well, uh, <laughs> I'm going to talk about all of Indonesia. You can look at South Sumatra. Uh, <laughs> Indonesia's economy has been growing at a rate of 6.6 percent, and the World Bank expects it will continue to grow at about. Uh, actually, it's been growing at about six and a half percent. The World Bank expects it will hit 6.6 percent this year. The per capita income of Indonesia is $3,500. There's a very fast-growing middle class of more than 120 million people hungry for consumer goods, and Indonesia has a stable banking and financing system that is supplying credit to these consumers. Almost 60% of that GDP is from domestic consumption, but the U.S. is largely not part of that picture. Uh, the master plan for economic development that I mentioned ha includes more than 500 projects throughout the, co the country, as well as six developmental corridors aimed at creating economic clusters in various industrial sectors. Now, let me, I'll be honest, Indonesia has been pretty slow to implement this plan. The, a, a year after it was launched, there have been groundbreakings that represent just 10 percent of its total value. On the other hand, any project that can be seen in any way as infrastructure will have the, the full-throated support of the government. And this plan recognizes that development is needed off the island of Java. Uh, in fact, and I think we see this in many of the APEC economies, innovation in Indonesia often doesn't come from the capital. Uh, I know we sometimes see that in our own country. Uh, often, innovation comes from dynamic local entities, uh, such as those found in South Sumatra and East Kalimantan. And I'm just going to use South Sumatra as one example. There are many. And uh, the report that our team produced includes many, many opportunities. But I think there's only time for one today. Uh, but let me mention that some of the U.S. companies that are very active in Indonesia are doing quite well. Caterpillar. Mattel, Goodyear, GE, Cisco, and Conoco are among the many U the U.S. companies that are doing quite well in Indonesia. And uh, in just a few minutes, if I can get it to go upright, uh, I'll show you a few, I'll go over just a few lessons from these companies uh, about how to achieve success when doing business in Indonesia. But here is South Sumatra. It's the, the provincial capital is Palembang. And that's one of Indonesia's wealthiest cities. The province's gross regional domestic pro uh, product averaged 5.3 percent from 2008 to 2011 and 6 percent in 2012. The governor of South Sumatra, Alex Norden, uh, has, has made as one of his signature achievements free education. Literacy rate for this region is 100 percent. Uh, and South Sumatra's strategic position, again, let's see if I can go back. Nope, I'm going the other way. Uh, the, it's, it's, the strategic position is, is also significant. It has the potential to become a transport hub for intra-Indonesian trade as well as international trade. The province has large coal resources and reserves and is expected to be a growth center for Indonesia. 
It has very solid energy infrastructure, such as power grids and gas pipelines to neighboring region. It has enormous geothermal potential. I don't know how many people know this, but uh, an enormous proportion of the, U the geothermal potential in the world is in Indonesia, and a huge percentage of it is in South Sumatra. There's also tremendous potential for railway and port expansion, and the province has a very strong agricultural base. There are also challenges. Uh, doing business in Indonesia uh, isn't considered easy all the time. Um, and in South Sumatra itself, while it's home to 70% of Indonesia's oil palm plantation area and 65% of its natural rubber production, productivity is low. There's a, a coal bed methane industry. It is still in its early stages. But Chinese, Korean, Japanese companies are headed there and they're making money. And I think, uh, maybe naively, but I don't think so. I think U.S. companies should be part of this mix. So we are seen, USA Inc. is seen by people in Indonesia as a superior brand in terms of our reliability, our quality, and our integrity, not only in South Sumatra, but in all of Indonesia. But we have to be there. We have to be present, and we have to earn the business. If this is at all interest, of, of interest, you will see many other examples of uh, uh, infrastructure opportunities throughout Indonesia on this website. And let me leave you with just a few final thoughts about doing business in Indonesia. One, you have to show up. You have to socialize your business, develop constituencies, court your community. And when I say show up, I think showing up is showing respect, and I think it's very important uh, to do that in Indonesia. I, don't, I think this probably applies to other APEC economies as well, but I want to sp uh, sp uh, speak to Indonesia in this presentation. Second, you have to do due diligence. You, it, you can't really just sort of waltz into Jakarta, sign a deal, and then uh, sit back and reel in the profits. You need to know your partner if you have one. Some companies have been uh, very, very effective in, in partnering with local <laughs> companies. Caterpillar is an example. Uh, you have to know who you'll do business with inside and out, and then you have to be patient and you have to persevere. If you're lucky and you have a great local partner, as Caterpillar does, terrific. If you don't have a great local partner or you choose not to go that route, you need a very strong local network. And Indonesia really is all about relationships. Uh, fourth is you need to give back. And that can be in the form of training, education, capacity building, corporate social responsibility. Uh, I, the way I look at, the, at this, Indonesia was colonized by a rapacious multinational company. And it's no wonder that they're a little suspicious as to whether benefits will be shared. They're used to companies coming in, extracting resources, and leaving. The companies that have done best, and I mentioned some of them earlier on, are the ones that have shown that they're also committed to capacity building, co uh, committed to, uh, you know, to stay, stay the course, to uh, educate their future workers, and to be part of the community. And then finally, uh, stick, to, uh, stick to your guns on clean corporate governance. U.S. companies are held to a very high standard, and not only via the uh, Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. Indonesians respect our reputation for being clean and transparent, and we need to keep earning that respect. So thank you very much. I look forward to your questions at the end of the panel. Thank you, Ted. I, th I think your five lessons apply to life, not just in Indonesia. <laughs> <laughs> so I appreciate that. Uh, Cameron, uh, could you give us a little broader perspective on Asia Pacific? Sure. Uh, thank you, Scott. Thank you, Ambassador, and thank you, Ted, for a very good uh, uh, s to get us started off in, in a very good way. I I'm going to address three things. Uh, first of all, I have no slides. Uh, I thought I'd set history of World Bank presentation without PowerPoint. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> um, I will first talk about the, the conversation which uh, Ted just started, which is why is the U.S. not there? And I, I'll, I'll speak to you uh, both as an American and as a World Bank staff working in certainly East Asia and the APEC region over the last uh, eight years. And uh, then I'll talk to you about the challenges um, in that part of the world to attract private capital from countries like the United States. 
and then I'll tell you what APAC is doing and where are the different programs and how they might be of interest to you for you to follow. Uh, first, uh, the U.S. situation. I, I mean, I, I'll, I'll break it down into two areas. One is more U.S. side of things, which uh, people like Ted are really making a, a real effort to create the awareness for this opportunity for American firms and, and also through the embassy and other uh, government agencies also creating even playing fields so that American firms can actually compete uh, properly. The other side of the equation is, um, you know, what, what the region is doing to attract firms from countries like the U.S. So on the U.S. side, um, I must say first it starts with our own positioning. Uh, frankly, if you look at, uh, Scott mentioned uh, one example of PPPs happening in the U.S., and there are a few scattered examples here and there. But frankly, over the last decade or two, we are well behind the curve and when it comes to innovative financing techniques for, uh, for infrastructure. We have relied too far too much on public budgets. We are seen as not necessarily the most innovative countries when it comes to financing infrastructure. We have the most efficient, well-known, robust municipal bond market in the world, bar none. There's nothing compared to that. Mm. Um, so we, we have that already in place a uh, long time ago, but we haven't really built on that. And, um, and, and people can look at that and say, oh, you know, there's tax exemption and so on that may or may not work in every country. So we have that advantage, but we haven't really uh, moved too far. So I wanted to make the point that U.S. is not necessarily seen as the beacon for innovation when it comes to financing infrastructure. And for our firms to go out and win business in this field, we need to actually look in-house a little bit more than what we have perhaps done over the last uh, decade or so. And the second thing that is relevant is that the marketplace has changed quite a bit uh, when it comes to infrastructure financing in emerging economies. It used to be very much a bank-led uh, market where banks, you know, long-term loans drove the market, used to have a lot of lawyers and loans, and that was how you got project financing done. Um, and in that were all these operating companies, the, the people who actually build infrastructure project and operate them. The market right now is led by private equity funds. So it is not led by banks. A lot of the European banks, U.S. banks have sort of, I don't want to say retreated, but pulled back a little bit. Uh, the operating companies who had infrastructure assets had their hands full managing the assets they have. It's a very big investment to undertake. So uh, most of the market that is uh, moving forward is being moved forward by the private equity funds. And so uh, that's one of the reasons why some of the big uh, developers, the infrastructure developers from the U.S., have really uh, sought more refuge in the Middle East and so on where public sector provides the big uh, funding and they can go and win the contract and make money. So there's a reason why so many American firms are not there, uh, which is more related to where the business is. Um, then the third issue is cost competitiveness. You know, we have a lot of regional banks that are very active. We have uh, sovereign wealth fund that are very active. And so it becomes a little bit of a you know competitive marketplace for American firms or firms from other uh, places in Europe and North America to come and compete in in, in Asia, and so that I, I wanted to just table that because that is not a trivial thing. If there is a bidding process and you're competing, you know how competitive can you be? Um, we do have a brand, as Ted mentioned. Absolutely, American firms are seen as the most professional and high quality players. But you know, with high quality come relatively higher prices and, and, and need for returns. And so that has to be balanced. On the ASEAN side, um, the number one issue is deal flow. Uh, there are not that many projects out there that one can say, okay, well, you know, I'm gonna have uh, 20 deals coming out of country X, therefore, and, and you know, uh, maybe five or 10 coming out from all these regions, so I have a total of maybe, let's say, 50 transactions I can go after every year. So it makes sense for me to set up an office, have a team, and so on. That kind of deal flow is not there yet. So 
if you are uh, a big global firm and these are tough times, you have to think twice about, okay, do you want to have a presence or not? And as Ted mentioned, you know, in these markets, you have to be there. You have to show face. You have to build relationships. So that, that's another um, angle. Now, let me just tell you the challenges uh, which kind of relate to this deal flow issue. Uh, most of this region, as you all know, has gone through substantial political change over the last decade and a half or so. Indonesia being a fantastic example. It's practically a new country since the 90s. <clears throat> new uh, constitution, new uh, political system, new everything. I mean, imagine going through a you know, like what we went through as a country after the revolution. It's a completely different thing. You have decentralization. You have a role for local governments. You don't have a very strong center. Uh, a lot of uh, responsibility for infrastructure has now been devolved to uh, subnational governments. And that's why some of the innovative work is happening at the subnational level. Central government is still trying to figure out how, what role they play, how much power they have, and how much power they actually don't have. So, the, and this decentralization is, has swept all across the emerging economies, uh, including Asia, and certainly East Asia. So, China, a lot of people uh, who don't know China uh, get very confused. I've been working in China for about seven, eight years. It's one of the most decentralized countries in the world. Uh, we, we think of China as, it's quite the opposite if, if you haven't really spent some time in China. Local governments have tremendous power and room to innovate in China. They can set their own even, you know, the central government is pulling back a little bit, but they could even set their own taxes. They can set up their own uh, most favored nation kind of structures for companies to come in and innovate. And so all that innovation is not coming out of thin air. It's coming out because there's an institutional room created for people to innovate. Some may go too far, clearly, uh, and have, <laughs> and will continue to. Uh, but it also provides you room for some very interesting innovations, certainly in infrastructure. And in the Q&A session, I can give you some examples of the types of things we've seen. Now, on the deal flow, uh, what's happening? Why are there not enough projects coming to the market? Uh, and this is, you know, uh, the Aquino administration has really addressed this issue and is very, very aggressively going after that. And I must say Philippines is one of the, uh, and I'm not saying this, Ambassador, because you're here. Uh, it, it really is um, a star in East Asia in terms of quick turnaround and the Philippines Development Report that just came out certainly shows the progress that Philippines has made. They've set up a PPP center. They've got deals going. They've got, they have done things that other countries have been talking about. Uh, that, but don't forget, Philippines had a head start on a lot of these countries. Philippines had a PPP center way back in the uh, early 90s. I remember working uh, on that. So, you know, this is what happens with political change. They were so far ahead, they lost quite a few years, but now that you have the right institutional structure, they've moved fast, very, very fast. Um, imagine the marketplace as this table, and you have four corners. So on one corner, you have the government, and the government basically does not have the capacity yet to prepare projects that can be called, quote, unquote, bankable. That a private investor could say, OK, this is a deal I can understand. It's prepared to international standards. I feel comfortable investing in this. So therefore, I'll go through the bidding process uh, for this. They don't have the capacity. They don't have the institutional structure. And in many cases, the line agencies who are responsible for preparing these deals don't have the budget to prepare. You'd be surprised how many times I have discussions with finance ministers saying, you know, there's a half a billion dollar toll road deal uh, they want to prepare and they want to get private investment. And I tell the, uh, the minister, yes, sir, but your team that is preparing this thing doesn't even have $300,000 to prepare this project. So how do you expect this to happen right? Yeah. On the other corner, you have advisors, people like Price, Waterhouse, Coopers, all these great consulting firms, McKenzie's and whatnot. They know how to prepare projects to international standards. But these guys live on fee. 
So they're waiting for government to sign a deal with them sure. and say, okay, <laughs> here's a contract for you to prepare. Right? So they are sitting on the sideline as well. What I'm describing to you is what in economics we call corner solutions, but in a funny way, these are pure corner solutions, right? So you got government on one corner, you got the advisors on the other corner, then you have on the side private equity guys, and they're saying, okay, I've got money, I've got the loaded gun, where's the deal? Show me a deal, I'm ready to bid, right? There's no deal. And then you have the banks, and the banks are saying, I'm, I have money, I'm reluctant, but I have money for the right project, I'm willing to go, but I'm not gonna go until the private equity guy moves forward. So if somebody puts equity, then I'm happy to come behind them and provide debt. But I'm not gonna go and lead on my own because being a debt player, anyways, you are once removed. So you wanna be more in the equity ownership kind of situation. And the solutions are sitting smack in the middle, right? And so the challenge now is for governments to try to figure out how do you bring all these four corners together? How can the government play a proactive role to bring people closer to uh, realizing these transactions? And various governments are doing various different things, uh, setting up PPP centers, setting up different institutions. Indonesia, for example, we have helped Indonesia set up a guarantee fund for infrastructure. And it's designed specifically to take away the transaction risk. So Indonesia, as you see, you know, the, uh, the long-term growth prospects look fantastic in Indonesia. Everybody wants to invest in Indonesia. Everyone wants to, as they say, ride the, the curve, the long-term curve. But where to park your money is not so easy, particularly in infrastructure. So the risk associated with wor working with government agencies is very high. So we help set up this very customized guarantee fund, which is not just a blanket guarantee of the central government. It basically is designed to improve the performance and incentive structure for the line agencies. So for example, if I'm a private firm, and Ted is the government agency, uh, and, and let's say, Scott, you are the guarantee fund, if the uh, government agency says, I will provide land or X, do X, Y, Z uh, for you by such and such time. If you don't do that, <clears throat> then in my contract, I stipulate the penalty per month or what have you. And when there's a default, the fund will pay me. But most importantly, the fund then has a backdoor recourse through Ministry of Finance to recoup its money. And that's designed to keep the line agencies honest. So they, they, when they promise something, when they sign something, they actually deliver. The problem is, you know, in a big country like that, for private sector, it's very difficult to sue the government. It's very difficult if they don't honor their obligation to kind of take them to court because that, that ends your, you know, past and future endeavors in that country. So, we, you know, governments are trying that. We're, we're also helping a number of governments set up what we call viability gap financing schemes, which is to say, let's say there's a project that costs $100 million, but if, if it was at $100 million, it's not very attractive, meaning it doesn't pay enough. The, the returns will not be high enough. But let's say at $80 million, it would be very attractive to private sector. So it makes sense for government to provide the 20 million through a transparent, consistent manner, and then let the private sector fund the remaining 80 mm -hmm. uh, on its own. Uh, and so, you know, these types of programs are now being implemented. Again, innovations to try to bring people closer to that solution. Uh, but I, I will stop here. I think I've already uh, gone over my my quota, but uh, in in the Q and A we can discuss further. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Cameron. Uh, very interesting and it's a very helpful perspective for a U.S. audience that that here in the heart of innovation we're losing out in innovation in infrastructure, which is in a world uh, like East Asia that is growing at six to eight percent a year. That's a big loss. So thank you very much. What I'd like to do now is turn to questions from the audience. Uh, would it like, uh, yes sir, just a second. Um, four rules for the questions. One, wait for the microphone to arrive, okay, because we are podcasting and, uh, and uh, webcasting this event. Uh, second, 
introduce yourself and your organization. Third, uh, direct your question if it's to a specific individual on the panel. And fourth, what I call the Alex Trebek rule, make sure your question is in the form of a question. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you, Scott. Uh, my name is Hong Fong Pho with the Department of Commerce. Uh, I do Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia. Uh, deal flows there are, of course, uh, not smooth as yet. That's, so that's why I'm particularly interested in um, Mr. Khan's uh, four corner solutions there. Um, I want to say that uh, there are ways that we're trying to look at this and to see what kind of role the government, uh, namely U.S. government, has in trying to pull together those different players in order to provide for the deal flows to happen. Um, one thing that I'm particularly concerned with is the fact that, um, as you all mentioned, U.S. companies don't seem to, in the eyes of the customers, be there. So what are your suggestions to, uh, for us to uh, be able to, to affect changes so that the perception first will change and then actuality hopefully will follow? Thank you. Uh, take one other question while we're stopped here. Yes, sir. I'm Mr. Lloyd from the University of Maryland. I'd like to address my question to Mr. Khan and Mr. Ambassador Quisha as well. Um, a huge of the Indonesian and Filipino diaspora, especially in North America and Europe, are very interested to invest back to Indonesia and the Philippines. But unfortunately, we have a big problem in. Um, especially in the south part of the Philippines, like Muslim insurgency, communist problems, and uh, should investors come to the Philippines, what are the assurances that they would not be kidnapped or tortured or uh, extorted or things like that, much as we wanted to invest in uh, issues like um, infrastructure or railway or health, for example. So we just want to be assured so that we don't put all our eggs into one basket and everything get broken. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, it's a very uh, difficult question actually, what can the U.S. government do? A and I say that it's difficult not because it's technically difficult, but we have to be cognizant of how much budget we have and how much, how much of our resources can we actually spend. <clears throat> You've seen our foreign ops budget has declined or has been diverted to certain other priorities. So within that context, we, you have to be realistic about what you can do. Uh, <clears throat> there are a couple of things that, that can be done which do, don't require that much budget. One is, I think, supporting people like Ted and, and the ambassador in Indonesia and, and other foreign missions that we have to really uh, show senior level presence on commercial issues and not just political issues. That's, you know, I've had discussions with the ambassador in, 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 in Singapore and other countries, and I always say, you know, Commerce, 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 we will win or lose East Asia based on our positioning on commerce, not, not on political stuff. Mm -hmm. It's a very, very tough road to hoe if we go down that track uh, because of very obvious reasons that you, I think, all know. Um, you know, some of these uh, countries do not yet have an even playing field. I mean, I'm not going to name them, but, you know, there, there are issues there. And so the more senior level presence you have, the more dialogue and engagements you have, the better your chances are that you will not only do service to yourself, meaning us, US, but we will be doing service to those countries as well. The, the guarantee fund that we set up, uh, one of the many objectives was to clear, create an even playing field. They used to have separate MOUs with different, different countries where, diff, you know, if you were bidding uh, in the same project, you could have country X, a firm from country X, which would have different situation financially because it had a guarantee from its government or it had a special arrangement in Indonesia, which some uh, firm from another country did not have. So this guarantee fund basically creates an even playing field. Now, that kind of stuff, we did it from the World Bank engagement side because we think it's good for Indonesia to have an even playing field so they can attract the right kind of firms. But not all countries have such things. I know Philippines has worked very hard to even the playing field, but it's still tough, you know, sometimes on a project-by-project project level. 
So that's one thing you, we can do. It doesn't require too much. It just requires this issue to be included in our set of agendas with that country. Uh, and I'm not sure, Ted can comment on that, I'm not sure that, that these uh, infrastructure and these types of commercial uh, dealings are really front and center in our dialogue yet, and I think they could be. The second area is technical advice, which the, uh, the U U.S. government provides less and less of, and that goes back to that resource issue and so on. And I think that probably we need to be engaged. Uh, I used to be at USAID many, many years ago, and I've seen how far the agency has moved over the last decade or so from these types of engagements. And I think we really need to uh, rethink our priorities. Mm -hmm. uh, just very quickly, I, I also wanted to say from the APEC side, uh, there's an initiative to help on this, at least the government institutional side. So uh, as Ambassador mentioned, we've been working with Indonesia to put in place a program that is a three-year program. You know, one of the problems with APEC is that every year there's a new chair, and every year there's a, almost like a reset button. So the agenda changes. So for infrastructure finance, we, we have agreed, and I think Indonesia is now really moving forward, is we connected the dots between Indonesia this year, China next year, and the Philippines the year after. So we have one, one program, deliverables in each of the three years, so that by the end of 2015, we would have a concrete um, uh, results. And the results actually are to try to move the entire region towards certain basic thresholds of uh, legal institutional frameworks that can support private investment in a very transparent and at an international standard. So, uh, and, and I'm very thankful to Philippines because Indonesia was on board, but we needed to get Philippines on board for the last leg. Yeah. And I think now getting China on is, is, is going to be easy because they are very big on this agenda as well. Very Thanks. good point. Uh, okay. Mr. Ambassador, you want to talk about the diaspora? Yeah, well, thank you for that question. Uh, certainly there are numerous uh, opportunities. I talked about the large projects, but there are also numerous uh, opportunities for Filipino Americans to invest in, in small businesses. We see one example, for example, tourism facilities. There's so many tourism facilities that have been set up, Luzon, Visayas, uh, and even Mindanao. These are being set up by Koreans, uh, Taiwanese, uh, uh, and of course, uh, local uh, investors too, Filipinos. Um, there are franchises, for example, that have sprouted all over the, uh, the, the country, uh, McDonald's franchises, Jollibee, uh, and so on. Um, quite a number of, in fact, Filipino Americans have already been uh, investing in the country. So uh, now, if you ask about Mindanao, uh, I think I would wait until that final peace agreement uh, has been signed, which we hope will be done this year. Because, you know, of the turmoil over the past four decades, the investments in Mindanao have been very limited, right. only in major cities like Davao, Cagayan de Oro, uh, and, and of course they have avoided the cities where, where there have been conflicts over the past four decades. So, but with the signing of this peace agreement, which we hope will be sometime this year, uh, tremendous opportunities will, will open up in Mindanao, too. Thank you. Thank you. I, yes, I, sure. I just, I'll briefly, I want to answer uh, Fong's question because I think it's very important. Uh, I completely agree with uh, Kamran that our, we will succeed or fail based on our economic engagement with Asia. The, the pivot, the Indo-Pacific pivot, will not work if it's just military. It will only work if it has an accompanying, effective, successful economic engagement strategy. Uh, what can we do as government to help? Well, one thing, and I, I put here the onus on us, is we have to be coordinated. Very often, as a you know, senior official in an embassy, I would have TDA one week, XM a few weeks later, OPIC a few weeks later. No one shows up in time for the deals. They show up when it's convenient, when they've got a budget. Uh, you know, a travel budget to show up. That does not work. We have to be effective USA Inc. We have to be coordinated. We have to be in the middle of the table, uh, making all the pieces of the deal come together. 
one of the things that the economic team did in Indonesia is we organized, uh, uh, and after putting out this report, we organized visits to Surabaya, Bandung, East Kalimantan, South Sumatra. We took U.S. companies to the second tier cities, introduced them to the provincial planning officials, to the people whom we already knew, leveraged the fact that we'd already uh, made investments, sometimes uh, USAID investments or MCC investments in those regions, so we could open the doors, we could get people in to see the top people. The problem is not enough U.S. companies are showing up. So we set up these trips and, you know, one or two companies will show up to go on them. I, in my view, we have to show up. We will not succeed if we don't show up. Thank you, Ted. And on that, I'm sorry, we've run out of time for the first panel, but people will stick around. You've been generous with your time this morning. It's my job to keep this uh, program on time. So yeah. please join me in thanking the, the, the first panel. Thank you for your very kind words. Not at all, sir.